Exactly. I mean, we we all know, especially on the right, we understand that there are two tiers of justice in this country. And so the point of laws that are more restrictive are obviously meant to be there. So that way for the, you could weaponize them against the people whose views you don't agree with and you don't want to have out there. And then you just don't have to enforce it for other people. Right. We see this with shoplifting around this country, right there, you could be a certain type of shoplifter in San Francisco, and you could just walk out of the store. They're not even running. They don't even have to worry. They just, they walk in with a big duffel bag and they walk out of the store. But, you know, if you're in New York city and you try, you push someone onto the subway, you'll probably be walking out of Rikers that afternoon. If you're the person who actually defends the people on the subway, you're in for a long trial and your life is over, right? So yeah, I, I generally believe that uh, the less government, the better. And uh, so adding any new laws for anything in general, but especially around free speech is just not a good idea. Hey, culminators. It is that time of year. What time of year? Time of year that you're watching this, of course. And one of the things that has made me merry recently has been getting to know a very interesting person named Erin Wexler. She is a young woman who has interesting things to say and who suddenly has gone, I don't want to say crazy viral, but pretty darn viral on TikTok. And before I introduce you to her, and part of what I'm trying to achieve here, by the way, is to be like one of the first people, you know, to to get her because she's going to blow up i want to share with you her pinned almost million almost million plays tiktok and it goes something like this i am in the liberal health cave that is new york city i was here for most of my life but moved two years ago to florida and every time i come back my friends like oh my god what do i want to be back do I miss it? It is the middle of summer, and everyone around me seems to be pale, unhappy, masked, and trans. Okay, I think that that. Not everyone is trans. Everyone's just kind of androgynous looking. Blah, the water. I feel like I'm observing the situation. And the men are all producers, or data. They all have pronouns in their bios. Plus, the Mario Kart style obstacle course of how you swear around all these people and I'm over to the music on the street because it's only about more complicated. But I would just myself every time I'm going to have a lot of videos. Asking for a chunko feels like a lot of But half the time they don't even have it. I'm just telling you to be accepting all prayers. Oh, I think I, I hope you heard it if you didn't see it. She's accepting all prayers. And let me tell you that this is a, a young woman whose prayers are accepted, as she, as she just explained to me. Aaron, welcome to the program. Ron, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, you and I spoke a little bit a couple of weeks ago, and we decided to never be friends and have nothing <laughs> to do with each other whatsoever, but that we, we did agree that we could both manipulate each other's audiences. Oh, uh, gosh. I don't want to feed into people's uh, elders of Zion conspiracies <laughs> because they're entirely true, and we're proving that now. So, Well, actually, they're not, though, because what, what, you, what your takes, what your non-lib takes demonstrate is that there are apparently some Jewish people besides Ron Coleman and a couple of other crusty types who see things who are very who are very Jewishly oriented and yet who nonetheless see things a little bit differently from the way people think of us seeing things. Yes. Were you born this way? I was. I you know, God made me this way. I am not one of the the red pilled folks from COVID. I'm not a red pilled Jew from October 7th, I was always a teeny little Republican Jew, just out fighting the good fight in New York State. Uh, and thankfully, I'm now in the free state of Florida. I got to make the move down here a couple of years ago. I'm very lucky that work afforded me to do that. But yes, I uh, I had to know what I was talking about from a very early age if I wanted to have a fighting chance. But you've been uh, you've been obviously focusing on becoming a, a social media influencer from a very early age, right? Not, <laughs> not at all. For uh, anyone watching this who hasn't seen my clips or read my articles, I They're just- terrible. They're just awful. And that's the proof. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, I appreciate it. I need, I need all the, 
<laughs> all the trash talk because it just fuels it fuels the fire around. That's what I'm. I'm here to build you up by breaking you down. Exactly. Um, I have a younger brother, so he gives me plenty of that. But uh, no, I I started posting a few months ago, and really, I, I I work in tech. I've been working in tech for quite a while now. I worked in finance before, and um, I've always had this very keen interest in politics. And I just felt like people need to know that you could be a woman, you could be young, you could you could be a, a kind of a different demographic than what you're used to seeing. You could be a Jew from New York and you could be a Republican and you could be conservative. And uh, I wanted to just start speaking my mind. I don't think my life is meant to be just sitting away typing anonymously behind a computer. So I put my face on it and uh, the rea- the responses have been incredible. And I'll say the the most surprising thing I've learned in posting over the last few months is how much people care. And I think we all get pretty jaded and think that people in our country don't know what they're talking about or don't care or aren't educated. And I've been really surprised by uh, by how much my audience cares, how they'll they'll pick apart a single word even. I don't mean like an in internet trolling ways. I mean, where they're so focused on the details and they're, they're really keeping up with what's going on that that's how much they care. And, and that's been really cool to see. Well, that is actually interesting because one of the things that Mrs. Coleman and I often fret over is, are are we making any kind of difference? You know, she writes for Legal Insurrection and I have wasted my life on social media. <laughs> and but, but for me, it's almost over, right? I'm So I'm just coasting downhill. We often wonder, is there anything, are, are, are we accomplishing anything? Because it seems that The same people make the same mistakes and fall into the same patterns over and over again. And here you are, young, fresh-faced, gainfully employed. And you you mentioned two things. One is that you, you, you felt that you could make a difference, and therefore you decided you wanted to try to make a difference. And two, you put your face behind it. You, and obviously your name you're not really advertising your name as such but once the face is out there yeah it's over right did did you have any concerns about having your name known i mean there are a lot of creepy people out there i, I don't you know i mean most from the point of view of being a young woman but all yeah but i really really mean because that's look if you have a facebook account then that's the same thing but i mean from the taking the politically incorrect side of things. Yeah. No, I mean, first on the the safety concern, which is actually the lesser concern, I think of what most people think about when they think of putting their name next to these ideas uh, is actually, there we go. Yeah, that's my face. That's the whole, that's the whole collection. <laughs> the whole page, it's all over. Uh, and uh, no, I on the security part, uh, as someone who is a very proud gun owner down here in Florida, that's not a concern. So if anyone's watching this and thinking you moved about- out of New York, okay, yeah. <laughs> so she's allowed to have a gun. I'm allowed to. Ha- I have multiple guns, and I have a couple thousand rounds of ammo sitting here, right next to where you can't see it, right out of frame. So uh, if anyone, if that anyone's is hot, that is hot. <laughs> so if anyone's thinking about messing around, you could try. Uh, and then, and then the, on the point of putting my face behind it, I actually, a couple years ago during COVID decided to start a very small Instagram account and was posting similar takes, but without my face. And it was more just tiles that I thought people would share. And it, it went nowhere. And I think it's because it's, you have no idea who's behind it. There's no personality to it. And I just decided people could tear me apart. I'm I'm assuming that will happen. I'm a conservative woman. We know the left hates anyone who goes outside of the the box that they've decided to put us in. So if you're black, if you're a woman, you're not allowed to have these differing viewpoints. And I decided I don't care. I'm not here to live my life for other people's opinions. I don't believe in reincarnation. I think this is all we get. And will I look back and be proud that I kept a job that no one really cared about, though I do really love the company I work for and they're really truly amazing people and I'm we're doing work that I'm extremely proud of uh, but that's not my purpose on this earth and I do think that society is so lost now I mean we're we've been seeing that for years especially since October 7th when there's just no moral clarity in our country how can I say that it's a, a sacrifice for me to put my name and face out there it's the smallest thing that I could do and and I'm really happy I've been doing it and I've 
I've been recognized a few times since I started. And yeah, well, tell, well, tell us about that. It's very few times, but okay, but it's very big recognition. Let's come on, come on, tell yeah. the people. Tell but people. I'll say, but they were both they were all women, and they all said to me, "Thank you for posting your content." And they're, you know, I'm doing this not, I'm not doing the way other, I'm not producing the same kind of content that other conservative females might be. It's generally me walking my dog with my hair up in some gross ponytail and a hat. And, you know, it's, it's really about the content and the fact that women are responding to that as well is really exciting. Maybe I should try doing some of this content. <laughs> yeah. It, I, I, I never really have figured out how to use TikTok. I just basically repost stuff, you know, excerpts from my, from my, but, I, but it's not, you know, to, to, uh, to quote, um, Brie Larson, they didn't make it for me. Um, <laughs> but you did get a different kind of recognition, not just on the street, right? I mean, you, you, you mentioned to me that you got kind of a couple of big, big time shout outs. From, got, yes. Which, and which video was that? Or, or which, which TikTok was that? Well, I've had the video you just played. I had a number of stitches uh, and yeah. which is people reacting to it. And there were some big personalities to that. So, I mean, Jack Martin, I like that it crossed outside of political lines. So you just have other big uh, social media types who've been sharing the videos. I did have a video that got dragged, absolutely dragged by the left, a different video. That's okay. Um, the, the, again, the hate fuels my art. So, and I expected it, but that was a, a couple months into posting content and that video. And, re and really it didn't, it didn't, you were, it didn't bother you at all. No, these are internet trolls. Like these are, I I'm doing something right. I am producing content. I know I do it for the people who love it, not for the people who don't. And so when there are people who like it and react positively to it, that's the only thing I care about. Uh, and so yeah, people could hate on it, but I expected that. I, again, I grew up as a, a sole Republican Jew in New York where I looked at my parents and said, now we're going to learn how to shoot guns. And so we'd go on the weekend. And I actually once once showed up to give a, a small side story of what it was like being a conservative child in New York City. I went to a very fancy prep school. I was very lucky to attend a top tier school in New York City. Uh, and, uh, and one day my teach, my history teacher pulled me aside on a Monday because I had a big bruise on my cheek because I'd been shooting that weekend and I was growing. And for anyone who knows guns, the, the barrel was a little shorter than it needed to be for my growth spurt that I'd had. And so I was really rolling into the barrel of the gun and the recoil caused a little bruise on my face. And the teacher pulled me aside and asked me, Aaron, I, is everything okay at home? <laughs> and, and and when I said, oh, Awkward. <laughs> yeah, when I said, oh, no, it's actually um, it's from a shooting kind of incident. Like it was from a mistake. It's I'm totally fine. I think that was worse than telling him my father was beating me at home. Right. He was so he was floored. I think he was unprepared for that answer. So um, I've I've always been standing on my own and now I'm not. Now I have I have followers. I have people who care. So no, I'm very the the hate is what fuels me. It doesn't it doesn't upset me. I mean, I think you know you were already familiar with what happens and can happen on social media. And, and yes. right, I mean, there when you're going to be explicitly political, which is what you are, it's right in your name. You know, it's going to be one way or the other, and it's not. It is not. If, if if no one is noticing you at all on the other side, then the the silo is working too well, and you're not going to get those kind of numbers either. I actually want to show you. You mentioned about the 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 oddity of the 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 Jew with a gun uh, in New York City. I'm going to show you something from uh, that I have posted a couple times on Twitter that you'll get a kick out. It takes a second to read, but it'll be well worth it. it it's for, it's from a um. It's from a, a a National Lampoon magazine feature called "The Civil War Between the Blacks and the Jews," hmm. uh, which I just happened to have saved and clipped. But the, the the main panel it'll take you a second to read, but it's it's the middle panel that you really want to read. Huh. That's kind of. Uh, I have to admit, it's 
still I, I don't sell guns, of course, but I, I and I do know which side they come out of, but that's about the extent. Of it. <laughs> and and some people have said to me, Ron, come on, Ron. I mean, you're you're actually kind of a relatively high profile guy and you're going, but you know, I'm I'm a tough guy. No, I I really should you know, I I, I started the process of applying to in so in New Jersey you have to get a license to buy a gun. Interesting. And I was in the middle of doing it and I got in my references and then I had to set up my fingerprint appointment and I'm not good at appointments. It's kind of like <laughs> there's a famous scene in Annie Hall, Woody Allen explains he's not, he's got a problem with authority. Yeah. I, I don't really have a problem with authority. I do have a problem with appointments. Now that you're doing this, has it whetted your appetite to step up your social media involvement? Uh, yeah, for sure. I actually started posting beginning of July and I thought, let me start posting some videos with my thoughts. And really everything I've been posting in the video you showed at the beginning, those are all things I have just said to my friends for years. And I thought instead of putting it in WhatsApp chats and texts with my friends where people ask me what I think about something, or I'm just replying and reacting to things that are happening. I thought, let me just put it online instead and just be more efficient with this. And I said, in two years, if no one cares about what I had to say, then I'll just delete a bunch of awkward and cringy videos that no one will care about. And my first video got 20,000 views. Now, of course, perhaps TikTok, you know, whets your appetite a bit and gives you views at the beginning to, you know, get you excited and post more. But, but it, it you know, after a month where I had a, a viral video with almost a million views, I thought, okay, there's something here potentially. And after a second month with another viral video that a lot of people on the left had a good time reacting to, but so did Ben Shapiro. So that was, you know, I don't care about anyone on the left who was reacting to it, to be on Ben Shapiro's feed and have him laughing at it was okay, well, folks. Well worth it. All right. So she, she just started doing this in July. Okay. And she just thought, oh, that's <laughs> my ideas on the, <laughs> and meanwhile, okay. The old man is on Twitter since 2009. I practically invented it. Right. <laughs> Ben Shapiro, to my knowledge, has never who, who is my client, <laughs> has never reacted to anything of mine on social media. What could be the difference between me and Alan? Alan, 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 Alan. It's okay. She's young, of course. That's all it is. That's all. It is. I asked you this when we first spoke. Did you, you know? Obviously, it's. It's it's better in life. I certainly have found this to be the case. To be attractive than to not be attractive. Uh, I, I, the I don't know how the algorithms know, but they do. Apparently, they do. Um, but I noticed in your in your, your content, you're not you're, you're not pushing cheesecake. You're, you're it's about it's a it's about the words. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, you're not just another pretty face, but okay, you're a pretty face. Uh, Again, I I learned not to feel guilty about becoming prominent based on my looks. And, and I think that everyone should feel that way too. Whatever God gives you, that's what you got to go with. Now, I noticed when uh, that you also have, uh, you know, you've been doing an increasing amount of, which makes sense, longer form stuff. Mm -hmm. You have written, I see from, from, from uh, Blaze Media. Mm-hmm. And it looks like you've got a couple of stuff. Now, you just submitted stuff and they took it, or did you did that did, did, did was it on the strength of of your social media popularity? They did not know. They they don't know that I am posting on on TikTok. Um and yeah, the uh my Twitter feed is pretty paltry. It's more about my personal feed right now on Twitter. Uh but your, uh, your, your, your personal, your private and confidential. That's that's no, like my, that's like my that's like my YouTube channel. No, anyone anyone can follow me at Aaron Wexler. You just have to know how to spell my name, which is very difficult. So and why? Yeah, let's talk about that. What the hell is that? Or, was that uh, your parents' idea, or is that something that you thought would be a you know a brilliant move? No, I can't take any credit for it. And I think part of my personality and and grit is partly being raised by great parents who made me tough, and some of it was the way my brain is wired. And I think a third of it is. From having a name like Aaron, A R Y N N E, uh, where from a very young age I had to be a very good speller and had to know that no one would know how to say my name right the first time. So Did they make that up, or is they totally made it up? They were ahead of the. So your parents are black, actually. Yeah, 
<laughs> I've had that joke before. I always, my favorite thing though, is when liberals want to find out why my name is Aaron, they ask in a very roundabout way. So they'll ask me, uh, you know, where, where are you from? And they, <laughs> and, and I'll always answer, oh, I'm, I'm from New York. And, and then, and they'll ask, oh, where are your, where are your parents from? And I'll say, Oh, they're also from New York. And, and it keeps going because we're from New York for a little while. And then, and then I'll, I'll eventually I'll have mercy on them and I'll say, uh, you know, oh no, no, no. Oh, it's just, they just made it up. Yeah. They just, they're creative people. Uh, is it meant to be a funny way of spelling Aaron or yeah. is it a girl way of spelling Aaron? It's a girl way of spelling Aaron. It's a girl way of the guy's name. Cause in, you know, in Judaism, we name after someone who's passed away, unless you're Safari or Mizrahi, and they name after the living. But uh, for Eastern, I've for us, heard that, but I've met very few actual Jewish juniors. Yeah, that could be right. Yeah, but uh, well, as, you know, so Ronald, Ronald, yes. I'm named after my father's grandmother, Rose. Of course, Ronald Rose. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I am named after a great uncle Aaron, and uh, but they made it Aaron with a tough New York A. And a Y, and there might be a Q in there. I'm not sure, but, but there's that's a lot going on. But that is cool. I mean, it is cool. Actually, now that I think about it, have you? Did you see if that's available as a handle on Twitter? Because you should grab that just as the one name. And, I did. I think I looked for the one name before. There are other Aaron's in the world now, and I, when I was a kid looking it up, and there were very few, and now there are more because now there are just all these. You know, people like to be very. I don't know, creative with their names, but I was, I was in a class of Rachel's and Sarah's with, with this name. So it's always distinguished me. In my era, all the boys are named David. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not really sure why, although someone, well, all the Jewish guys, someone suggested maybe it was after David Ben-Gurion, which would be astonishing to me that, mm. but my middle name is David. Um, the reason I actually want to put this back on screen because you meant, you talked about where you're from you have actually you're from New York and you live in you've lived in New York and now you live in Florida, which is you know kind of South Florida, so it's New York South. Um, but you've lived in Israel for more than a little bit of time in your life, isn't yeah. that isn't that true? It is true. <laughs> you live uh, tell or just you know you you went to Tel Aviv University, was it? No, I never no? studied in Israel. I never did. I, 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 oh, you worked there. I worked there. I worked there as a proper, you could continue, yeah, you can continue freeloading on the blaze if you don't want to subscribe. But I'm actually subscribed. I just never, yeah. everyone's always logging you out. Isn't that, a, how many times do you have to keep logging into things? Yeah. You need a password manager, but we could talk about that after No, this. I have one. I have one, but I have two. Google and Dashlane are always fighting with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really always really want to turn off the Google entirely because I don't know. Sometimes, why. sometimes it's useful, but I have a lot. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, but no, I worked, I was working in Israel as an adult from 2018 to 2020. And I happened to move back to New York on March 15th, 2020, which was planned many months before we'd ever heard of COVID. Uh, but I, yeah, I lived in Tel Aviv as a working adult, paying rent, paying all, you know, really properly living there. So you must have visited before, like you must have had a connection, right? You, you Was your family one of those let's go to Israel a bunch of times. Yes. Family. Yes. I feel very lucky. We went all the time. And so uh, I had a really full life there already. And I was going a lot with work before for the company I was working for. And they gave me the opportunity to go and stay in Israel. And I, I took it and I'm really glad I did. And it also, I, even, even before that though, I had a very uh, uh, sharp understanding of the politics in Israel. I have family in Judea, Samaria, I hitchhike through the West Bank when I'm there. Uh, although I got kind of tired of like always having like a baby in my lap and like a kugel that I had to balance when hitchhiking. So I decided to start renting a car. But uh, I, you know, especially not her baby, not her, not cook. my baby, not my baby, but uh, someone else's child, like crawling all over you, which is really nice that people it's a very normal thing in the West Bank where people just hitchhike and people will take you to where you need to go because the buses just don't show up. But I I really under, I pass through these checkpoints people talk about and, you know, drive on a road with other Palest you know, Palestinians and shop in a supermarket next to Palestinians. And, you know, so especially with everything in the news today, um, I have a lot to say about it. Uh, but yes, I did. I've spent extensive time in Israel. You do have a lot to say about it. And you said some of it in this in this uh, article, which mm -hmm. I had put on the screen. I'm putting it back up now. 
The conflict is so much bigger than Israel, and it's already here. It's from earlier this week, November 2023, or earlier this month. Leftists have long believed America is an evil empire to be destroyed from within, and uh, those they're riding the wave of this moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is... is Israel, it's it's really hardly even about Israel in many respects. Yes, yes, I agree. And, you know, even though as much as this is about total hatred of Jews, I don't even like using the word anti-Semitism because I think we use it so much now that it, it's almost meaningless. Uh, and, you know, we have all these anti-Semitism committees on college campuses and it always has to be said with Islamophobia. So, you know, it's kind of it's kind of irrelevant now, but there is serious Jew hatred in this world. It is the world's oldest hatred. And yet, and yet, this has almost nothing to do with Israel, right? This is a proxy war with Iran. And it's it's even broader than a proxy war with Iran. This is really, we are at a moment in history right now where it is, it is just good versus evil. It's the nihilists versus humanists, right? That's this is the moment we're in in time. And it's we're seeing it across Europe and South America, and the United States, and the Middle East, it's its everywhere. Except, you know, you, you look at what you look at, look at Ireland. Yeah. So there, the largely anti-Semitic population. Mm -hmm. And I just say that as a throwaway, it's not like a big deal. They're not busy, as we say in 2023 parlance, hating on Jews. Okay. In Ireland, there aren't a whole bunch of Jews for them to bother with, but everyone knows they're they're pretty weak. They're a pretty woke crowd, mm -hmm. and and have never been uh, particularly fond of of the Hebrews. Um, they've been importing massive numbers of refugees mm -hmm. from countries that any reasonable person would want to be a refugee from, but they're not really refugee refugees. They're just refugees we want to live in ireland instead of living in algeria right and as, so as we all know there was a violent incident and a native irishman or irish young person was um assaulted and what killed oh yeah and the irish absolutely they were kids, i think they were like kids. they were young blew their tops the, the irish blew their tops and this has exposed a gigantic fault line among on the, i mean are these people good or are they evil i don't know i mean they're one thing is for, is for sure they're dissatisfied with how it's going mm -hmm. at the same time the irish government is trying to pass it not at the same time as a result of or under or rationalized by these riots that are taking place these anti-immigrant riots they want to pass a sweeping new anti-free speech law in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Now, this puts people who are keeping an eye on Jew hate in an interesting spot also. Because here we are talking about situations where expressions of antipathy and hatred towards Jews on campuses, uh, in front of the Democratic National Committee, in front of the White House, whatever it is, have led and do lead to actual violence or in that high school in Queens, mm -hmm. actual violence against Jews or against people or, or against people or, or entities that are, are associated with Jews. That's hate speech is never going to be against the law in the United States, but speech that incites people to violence. It's a very, very narrow exception to free speech, but we're actually seeing it in play in these pro-Palestinian, I'm using a lot of square quotes, scare quotes in today's episode, and these pro-Palestinian demonstrations that have turned violent. Mm -hmm. Here in Ireland, it isn't really about the words at all. It's about so something happened, and then, you know, there might have been people communicating with each other, but it's not as if there, as far as I know, there was some big slogan or something but the what the, what they want to make illegal is to even be in possession of materials that could tend to in other words this really really broad definition of of inciting violence mm -hmm. we have a problem right people like you and i because we're you can't paint broadly 
on this topic of what level of speech, what kind of speech, what kind of activity is prohibited. It can't be, oh, it's, mm-hmm. it's based on hatred. It's based on, because, no, you have to make real distinctions. You have to actually say, well, is there really violence taking place? Is there, or is there, or is it just, we want to arrest whoever we want to arrest based on what they said? Do you think there's any way to 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 get that across to, to people in general? In other words, are you anti free speech or pro free speech? Oh, I'm anti violence, and I'm pro free speech. Is that's that's doable, right? Yeah, I mean, I actually think it's a different problem, or it's a part of what you mentioned, which is. Uh, this is all a farce, right? This is all, it's a subterfuge for control and power and and being able to decide how a population is able to speak and therefore the way they're allowed to think. So do I think that Ireland cares about stopping violence and that's why they want to change speech? Or do I think that they want to control the things people are allowed to say? And it's obviously the latter, right? So, you know, it, and, and where I land in terms of free speech is I, I'm a free speech absolutist, I personally thought Kanye should not have been kicked off of Twitter. And I say that as a Jew, right? I thought that was a mistake. And I think there's a clear distinction between being hateful and calling for violence. So there's a difference between saying, you know, I hate this group of people, which is horrible. And saying that about any group of people is a grand generalization that should never be made, but except for certain groups like Hamas, where we can all just agree that we hate. But but in general, you should be able to say, I hate these people or is you know they're all what you can use whatever characteristics you want whatever adjectives but when it comes to actually saying now go and take action against them and i and i understand that what i'm saying is that being able to say negative things about groups of people can ultimately lead to violence but you know i think that's i think the rot is not in the speech the rot is in the culture the rot is in so much else in society that then it comes out in speech later, but that's not what we should really be fighting. And I'll suggest something else to you that I that I've been saying recently, which is that talk. Tell me about your concerns about. Uh, tell me that you're worried about inciting violence. After you show me that you actually will do something when there right. is violence, mm-hmm. there have. I mean, one person was arrested at that White House riot. One person was arrested at that DNC riot. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to arrest people for literally committing crimes of violence, then you certainly can't tell me that you're worried about what they say that might lead to violence. You really don't care about violence unless it's the kind of unless it's violence of a political tenor that you don't like, in which case you don't even, as, as you point out, it it doesn't matter what you do. It matters which category you're in. And if, you know, if, if, if the Irish government decides that your, your, your phone says, or your, or your, your uh, Instagram says things that we don't like, we're going to knock, we're going to knock you out. Exactly. I mean, we, we all know, especially on the right, we understand that there are two tiers of justice in this country. And so the point of laws that are more restrictive are obviously meant to be there so that way for the you could weaponize them against the people whose views you don't agree with and you don't want to have out there and then you just don't have to enforce it for other people right we see this with shoplifting around this country right there you could be a certain type of shoplifter in san francisco and you could just walk out of the store they're not even running they don't even have to worry they just they walk in with a big duffel bag and they walk out of the store but you know if you're in new york city and you try you push someone onto the subway you'll probably be walking out of Rikers that afternoon. If you're the person who actually defends the people on the subway, you're in for a long trial and your life is over, right? So yeah, I I generally believe that uh, the less government, the better. And uh, so adding any new laws for anything in general, but especially around free speech is just not a good idea. And that's the micro. Let's take a look at the macro. Another, your more recent article in Blaze, uh, about Iran. The headline is sanctions relief for Iran shows how little the U.S. has learned. And the pull quote here, it's almost as if Iran is a force of nature rather than a country susceptible to rewards and punishments like any other. You can say that about Hamas. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, what we really need is a ceasefire. There was a ceasefire through midday October 7th. Mm-hmm. What we really need is cash free bail. That's That's what criminals need that's not what the rest of us need 
What is it about liberals? Have you had a chance in your brief time on the planet to figure out why they're so contemptuous of the concept of incentives? Have you ever? Yes. I've actually thought about this a lot, a lot. And, uh, and this is something that actually Ben Shapiro talks about a lot. So I'm, I'm quoting him just because I don't like stealing ideas. I know it's another, another great man with another great podcast. Uh, but he, I agree with his, the way he categorizes uh, the framework for this is he's not to super, quote him. Like, super, he's a super smart guy. Come on. He's no, super he's smart. And I feel like I'm quoting like, like as Socrates would say, but you know, but, but he talks about, is it stupidity or is it malice? And I just, I don't want to use a sentence that's not my own. So um, is it stupidity or is it malice? And that that's where the quote ends. And, and with my analysis of that, of that framework is I've long, I, I generally like to think that people are just naive, right? And I, I do generally think the left in America sees the world as a, wouldn't it be nice, right? Like, wouldn't it be nice if like, I, and it used to be up until five years ago that I gen genuinely believed that the left and the right in this country actually wanted the same outcome. We just had very different ideas of how to get there, right? So yes, wouldn't it be great if we had fewer homeless? Wouldn't it be great if people had better medical care? Wouldn't it be great if we... And you could you could go through that, but we believe that the community knows better, and we don't believe that universal health care in a country of 340 million people works. And and you could go through those different examples. I no longer believe that. I no longer believe that we want the same things, and that comes into play with the policies on Iran, around Hamas, and and many other things that that the left is pursuing right now. And I no longer think it's it's naivete. I think I really believe that that. A lot of people in this country genuinely hate the United States of America, and they believe that we are a country to be destroyed from within. And so how do you do that? Well, you dismantle society, you rot people's brains, you make them weaker, right? We have a country of people that will cry if you misgender them and can't function. They didn't go to work the day after Donald Trump won the election, but I somehow managed to go to work the day after Joe Biden won. You know, it's a uh, uh, we're so they're they're slowly dismantling the country and they genuinely don't believe that America should be a superpower. And so that's why we're allowing Iran to take, you know, to fill that void in the vacuum of the world stage where we have completely retreated from. Have you seen people in your age group coming around to realizing this? People who, you know, maybe even voted for Joe Biden and realize now, my God. I think they slowly are. There are some people who can never be saved. And uh, I like the, I saw a tweet a couple of weeks ago, which is, you know, you could, you could stick your head in the sand. They'll just behead you a bit lower down the neck. And, and I think that's very true. And I think there are people that it doesn't matter how much evidence they see. Pe people just don't want to see what they don't want to see. And that will always be true with a certain group, but a lot of people are slowly coming over and I, I was with a friend recently who was a longtime New York liberal, New York Democrat, and they described themselves to me recently as center right, which I was floored to hear. And, and they are, it's anecdotal, but they are one example of many people that I've spoken with that feel similarly. But there's, there's the question of, you know, liberals in general, millennials in general, and how they're voting. And then there's the Jewish Democrat and what we think will happen with that, with, you know, with that community. And those are two very different questions. I will just say one thing before I think you're going to ask a follow-up on that. I, I will say that as conservatives, we are building a golden bridge for people right now. I we're being so unbelievably nice and gracious to the people who have been nothing of the sort to us for our entire lives. It's always been like, oh, isn't it nice that our friends forgive us for voting for Donald Trump? Isn't it nice that they forgive us for our evil conservative values? And here they are, their world has has tilted onto a new axis, right? And for many Jews that happened on October 7th, I think for people like us, it, it's the least surprising thing to happen in our lifetime, sadly. But it was, of all the things that have happened, I mean, this is our lives have been the exception to the rule, not the rule. And October 7th was the rule. And we went back to the way life like, has generally been for Jews and just the world in terms of barbarity versus civilization. So, right, right. And, and here we are. You've and, obviously read, read a book in your life. <laughs> because yes. because the only, like, you only need to read one. You need to read one book <laughs> to understand this. It doesn't even take more than one. 
but we are rolling out the red carpet for people to come over and be, and, you know, so I just, I do want to say that, which is, we're just so polite. And I just, because we're here and this is being recorded, I'm going to say this once to anyone who could be listening, who's a liberal. I told you so. That's it. I told you so. You told but you so. <laughs> and I hope they're going to keep listening. What did you think was going to be my follow-up question? About Jewish Democrats. And if we think that they'll actually vote red in the next election. Is well, that I, you know, look, I think we know the answer to that. I mean, part of the, the answer is no. The answer is right. no. Yeah, for anyone because listening. Because it's a matter of religious commitment. It is. People are always asking me this, and, I, and I've been talking about it for so many years, but the, the answer just never seems to satisfy people. Why do, why do so many Jews vote for the Democratic Party? And, and the, you know, I, I do think the answer is they really believe that it is a moral, it, it's, it's simply what they are. It's, what the, it's simply what they are, and they can't, they can't imagine doing otherwise. And, and now, you'll, you'll hear a lot of people, I think, say, well, if it weren't Trump, I would, but it's not true. Because whoever would be the Republican nominee, they would turn into Trump. Because the Trump that you're thinking of isn't even the real Trump. It's the Trump that has been created for you, to mm -hmm. created for your consumption by the media and by all the and by the Democratic Party. I mean, I lived in New York my whole life. Donald Trump was not known as a racist, a bigot, no. No. certainly not an anti-Semite. He's in the real estate business in New York. It's just something that they made up and, and millions and millions of people accept it uncritically. So you're going to help everyone change their mind about this, right? I am I am attempting to. I will say Norman Putheritz saw this a long time ago. He wrote that book, Why Are Jews Liberals? Uh, but I think it's, if, in, we need a new addition to that because that was written quite a while ago. Um, but even that book, I guess not to knock on a great thinker because, but it's not that novel of a question. I remember when the book came out and everyone talking about, you know, you have to read this book. I've had so many people gift me this book in the past. Um, but Jews have been like Marxists for a long time, right? The founders of the state of Israel, many of them were idealistic, secular Marxists. Trotsky, Marx, like we, you could go, you could go far back and find this problem. So when it comes to, to your point, is it Donald Trump? No. And, and I've racked my brain around why we are this way. Uh, and I, I haven't come up with a, a great answer other than perhaps we're so used to suffering. We've decided to just vote it into office. <laughs> and on that note, Aaron spelled funny. Thank you very much for culminating with me this fine day. I hope to see more of your output and your opinions and your insights and to watch you turn into the, influ I don't want to say influencer, because I think that's becoming a really dirty word, yeah. but the influential participant in the public debate that you ought to be in the coming years. And I, I'm, I am confident we will talk again soon. And Thanks. everyone who wants to find you has to remember that even though we have been, been making fun of your name uh, and, and how you spell it, that the, the main action, the main action is at non-lib take. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, screen. Non-lib take, there she is, non-lib take, on TikTok. And she's going to make me a big Instagram. TikTok star. I, I'm sorry. No, this is this is TikTok. Yeah, that's TikTok. But they could also find it on Instagram. I've I've gotten requests to go there. I think probably a lot of your viewers would not have TikTok, which I support. So they could also find me on Instagram. You're doing it really because of, it's just something that you owe to. Exactly. Yeah. I appreciate that. So yes, and you had you told me that on TikTok. No, I'm sorry. Yes, that on, that on Instagram, uh, that was something that you wanted to build up. So I'm going to throw that up on the screen as well. And and let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, this is your chance to get in on the ground floor on TikTok. See, because only 730 followers, 734 <laughs> followers on on TikTok on Instagram uh, on it's Instagram. Oh, so you could be one of the first thousand followers and you there will be a special prize. Um, 
which we will which we will disclose at some later date. That's where to find her. We'll be talking again soon. Thanks again, Aaron. Thanks so much, Ron.